Well, all right. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the uh, Oak Park Neighborhood Association meeting, December 2021. Uh, really, you know, appreciate everybody making the time this evening. Um, again, we have these meetings uh, the first Thursday of every month. At currently at 6 p.m. We used to do them in person at the Oak Park Community Center. I haven't been doing that for quite, for a while since COVID. Uh, I think we actually had a meeting on March 6th, 2020, and then you know the rest was history. Uh, that was our last in-person get together. Um, but you know the we we've been doing these virtually for for a while now, and um, it looks like that will continue considering the the new variant. Um, but the, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Oak Park Neighborhood Association, we're a uh, uh, just about 20 year old nonprofit uh, here in here in Oak Park, and we have uh, really, really our, our niche is trying to ensure that, that this neighborhood is the best place in Sacramento to live, work and play. Um, so that's what we do. We're, we're a five independent 501c3 nonprofit run by a group of volunteers. Uh, a couple of us are on the call and a couple, a couple more will be joining us in a little bit. But um, first thing what we usually do is a round of intros to get to know one another a little bit uh, better. So um, why don't we do it popcorn style? Uh, so my name's Adrian Wren, I, uh, and, and we'll, so we'll share our name and then let's share, you know, if you're affiliated with the organization, you can share that. If you live in the neighborhood, why don't you also share where in the neighborhood you live? So my name's Adrian Wren, I'm president of the Oak Park Neighborhood Association, and I live on 4th Avenue and 39th Street uh, near the corner. Um, let's go to John next. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Febo. I'm the general manager for the city's recycling and solid waste division. Um, Jess will give the presentation, but I always uh, like to listen in. And um, I don't live in Oak Park. Uh, I have a house in Tahoe Park, but I currently live in David. Um, anyway, um, happy to be here and listen in. And if you have any questions and doesn't need, you know, we can answer or I can. So. Look forward to uh, the meeting. Great. So now pick pick uh, another person, anybody at all. Sure, I'll send it to Barbara Steinberg. Uh, hi, my name is Barbara Steinberg, and um, I live in Talic Village off of 21st Avenue on Ortega, or I own a home on Ortega. Uh, most of the time for almost the last two years, I can't believe it's been that long, I'm living in Chico, but I do, uh, I am in Sacramento uh, at least once a month for a few days. I'll be there all next week. And I'm also um, on the Stockton Boulevard Partnership Board as a neighborhood advocate. And I haven't, as Adrian said, I haven't been to the, one of these meetings in quite a while. Life seems to be speeding on. And so I'm happy to be here tonight and find out what's going on. And I'll move it over to Darnell. My name is Darnell Dumas. I'm a homeowner service coordinator for the Habitat of Humanity of Greater Sacramento. And um, we do work, of course, in Sacramento and um, the neighboring uh, cities. And we're just here to listen and learn. So I look forward to tonight's meeting. Um, my turn, right? Uh, Neela's phone. <laughs> Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so not savvy at all this. And I'm trying to find a picture and I can't even do it. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Nyla Taylor Eubanks. I'm a, an RN. I work at Mercy General Hospital and I work in the GI department. Um, I have been listening in um, in October and now December um, on this awesome um, board meetings, uh, Zoom um, discussions, because um, I'm currently um, obtaining my BSN and I've had uh, the opportunity to work um, in this last class on um, community health. And so I chose Oak Park. I live in Elk Grove, California and um, I had a co a classmate who lived in Oak Park, so we worked together um, to go ahead and, and and work on a plan 
And so um, I have um, had to implement an uh, intervention and I am currently looking at the homeless pop population that is very rampant in Oak Park. So um, my, the reason why I'm here is just to continue to just be an advocate for anyone who needs help. And, and I, I just want to be a voice and to help in any way that I can. So that's what I'm, I'm doing here. I, I, I just, that's just my nature as a nurse. So um, I'm here for that. Wonderful. Let's go to Michael Blair next. Hey, everybody. Michael Blair. I'm a board member here at OPNA and I live in the south part of Oak Park. And let's see. Did I hit all the buttons? I think that was it, right? I can do a yeah. short. Okay, cool. All right. I'm picking uh, somebody I haven't seen in a long time. I'm picking Hillary. Hello, long time no see. <clears throat> uh, my name is Hillary. I am with Vice Mayor Chenier's office. Um, we represent District 5, and that includes Oak Park, South Oak Park, um, that area of 99. Um, and I am his district rep. And then I will pass it to Jessa. Hi, I'm Jessa David, and I'm here with the city of Sacramento to give the presentation on recycling, but I actually also live in Oak Park uh, near 4th Avenue Park off 4th Avenue. So happy to be here for that as well. For neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Sure. Let's go to Patricia Foley next. And you'll want to unmute yourself, Pat. Good evening. Apologize, I'm sharing a internet with uh, another working person in the house. Um, my name is Patricia Foley and um, I'm also a home um, services coordinator from Habitat for Humanity. So very happy to uh, be on this uh, Zoom call with you all today. And again, I, I'm mirroring Darnell. We're, we're here to learn and, and uh, see what's going on and how we can uh, continue in partnership together. Great. How about uh, Becky's iPad? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have been in Oak Park for about 20 years. I live on 41st Street, about halfway between 2nd Avenue and Y Street. And I am tuning in tonight because I'm can I'm confused about the new recycling that seems to keep changing every six months. Got it. Well, we'll be, we'll be learning a lot about that today. So, so thanks for being here. I don't um, have of the participants. So could you ch check the next one for me? I can. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Kim. And Kim, you'll want to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, my name is Kim, and I live here in Oak Park um, on 3rd Avenue. And I have not been uh, to a meeting in several years, and I'm trying to get back in, into these meetings again, attending them. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Uh, how about Dimitri? Uh, what's up, all? Dimitri Gudemene. I help run Cap City on the corner of Broadway and MLK. Thank you. And uh, looks like the last person is a number 992-843-47712. Hi there. My name's Joan. I live in Tahoe Park, and I um, signed up to learn more about the recycling. I'm totally up here. I'm from the Bay Area. I remember when San Francisco started their their um, version of recycling, well, and composting. I used to compost here, and then when that that cockroach showed up, I I don't put anything outside that I can't. But I'm um, looking forward to the new recycling program. So that's it. Wonderful. So uh, before I turn it over to our friends with with the city and and uh, to 
educate us about, about the whole recycling leaf season organics, um, uh, 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 the changes to that. Uh, just want to kind of give a little bit of a roadmap for some of the other topics that we'll talk about afterward. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot happening in the neighborhood. I, just the other day, there was a uh, fatal crash at MLK and Broadway, and almost exactly two weeks before that, there was another fatal crash just a few blocks away on 42nd and Broadway. So I do want to, you know, toward the end of the meeting, talk a little bit more about that. There are some neighbors who are, um, who want to get together and, and try to find a solution uh, to, to some of the, the just the, the, these, these awful crashes that are killing people in our neighborhood. Uh, so we want to talk about that. There's, uh, you know, Mick George uh, Law School also uh, applied for an upzoning uh, thing, meaning that there could be potential development there. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, there's a, there's a lot there's a lot going on in the neighborhood. So uh, there's also several projects along Highway 99 that that uh, Caltrans is seeking our feedback on. Really cool beautification and safety related projects. Um, and then, of course, the opportunity to do a mural at the end of the Second Avenue undercrossing under Highway 99. So I want to talk about that and then all, all sorts of all sorts of other things. So that's a little bit of a preview for some of the things we'll be chatting about after after our, our presentation. So we'll get there. I know uh, we, we could hop into a lot of discussion on it. But I think with that, I will I be turning it over to, to Jessa first uh, and you guys can take it away and lo looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, oh, I see I have the option to share my screen. So yes, I'll be giving the presentation, um, but John may jump in if, I, if he needs to add anything. Um, and we'll both be here for questions. Can everybody and see we, my screen? We can see it. Okay. Um, would you like questions kind of as you present or, or at the end? Uh, sure, as we go. I mean, so people don't forget them. Yeah, if they're in the chat, we'd probably address them after. But, um, but yeah, I'll just jump right in. Uh, we don't have we don't need to take up too much of your time and we'll leave time for questions, but um, just have some updates with our department, some including some major changes. But right now, a uh, yearly update is that leaf season is underway. So that means right now we have loose in the street leaf collection for your yard waste. We still encourage everybody to fill up their yard waste container first because that still is gonna be collected weekly and that will ensure that our crews get through the streets as quickly as possible. Um, and you can fit a lot into those bins. So we really, encourage people to do that first and then form a pile. And you can check your calendar. It does change frequently. So, you know, even daily, it just depends how quickly our crews are able to move through the streets, how much material there is, what kind of weather we're getting, um, how many people are using their containers, things like that. So you can always change, check your calendar because it might change. And that'll be through January. Uh, and that also means we don't really have uh, the household pickup until February again. We'll give an announcement when that's available because um, we're concentrated on leaf season. And right now, as we've already discussed, as you're all sounds like you're well aware that there's a, a new law coming, which is affecting commercial entities already, but it'll be coming into uh, play for our residential customers starting next year. We anticipate, um, and what this is, is a huge statewide mandate and uh, with the aim to reduce methane and other greenhouse gas emissions in the landfills. So food waste and other organic waste is a huge waste stream in California. And so through various programs, the idea is to reduce a lot of that um, organic waste through you know, food, edible food recovery and composting and things like that. So for our customers, we will be um, offering a free countertop food, food scrap collection container, little compost caddy. These are just samples. We'll, we're still working on the procurement of those, but we do plan to probably send out a postcard and people will be able to pick them up I don't think Oak Park Community Center is one of our community centers, but we will have them located around the city so that people will be given, you know, a, a window of a couple hours maybe and go pick up their free bin and along with a roll of plastic compostable bags and um, a little brochure with information of what goes in the organic waste, what doesn't, uh, how to avoid, you know, odor and pests and things like that. So lots of information will be provided as we go, you know, leading up into this program. So we'll make sure that everyone has that information. Some other changes we've had, uh, we have been working on um, you know, increasing the efficiency with our service. This includes last year, we moved from a four day collection week to five days a week. So that ensured we had you know, less uh, full days where we'd have to end up skipping a collection and it would go to the next day. So fewer people had uh, service interruptions and that's enabled us to enhance our service. 
We also completed the recycling processing agreements with the three different vendors who will be providing our organic recycling starting next year. So we know who those will be. And we've converted about 85% of our collection fleet to compressed natural gas and are also working on testing an electric side loader for um, evaluation, but it's, it has to do a lot of service and provide a lot of um, strength and everything. So it, it, we'll see, but it would be nice to be able to, to replace some of our fleet with electric side loaders, but we still need to test it. But we're looking forward to that. Um, we've also been working on the CNG station. This, uh, I think it'll be completed next, maybe January now, um, but it, it's, it'll be complete imminently and that'll help reduce, you know, time on our roadways, fuel surcharges and increase productivity overall. I have a question about the second bullet on that page. Um, it said you guys have three vendors for where, so basically where the organics are gonna go. Um, what are those vents? So what are they? Who are they? Uh, one is Yolo County Landfill, which they take our green waste now. Um, so it'll depend where you are in the city. The other one is Agriman and then uh, the North Area Recovery Station. So it, it, depending where you live in the city, uh, it'll reduce my, you know, you, it'll depend where your waste goes, basically. Uh, I'm not sure where ours would go, but, but yeah, so we have those three processors in place. It was put in a competitive bid. There were eight proposals total, and then these were the best that we could identify. Thanks. Um, we are also working on increasing the efficiency of our vehicles overall of our fleet um, with GPS monitoring uh, scales so that our operators know exactly when, they're, when their load is full and they can go uh, rather than having guesswork. Uh, again, reduces time on roadways, all those things. Um, we've also been uh, working for um, dealing with some of the illegal dumping that's happening all over the city. So our crews and equipment are called on to help with that. Um, even though those aren't really, we don't have the infrastructure in place to service those areas. So it does take from our, our crew and our equipment. So that's kind of increased that demand, but we've been working on helping the city with that. And now, as you all might also be aware, you should be aware there's a rate proposal adjustment a rate adjustment being proposed right now. So in light of the organics recycling law coming up, that's a primary driver of why we need to increase our rates. Um, because the processing right now, our uh, green waste is processed and becomes kind of landscape cover, which can be used in city landscaping or goes to, you know, winemakers in Napa or other local agricultural users. But in the future, when it gets processed with food waste combined, it'll be turned into a really nutrient dense compost. Um, so that'll be a lot more, you know, efficient and more useful, but it is a lot more expensive of a process to, to process green waste and food waste together. So that's a primary driver again of why the rates are going up. Uh, there how was a, how much are they going up? I have a chart coming up. I should put it okay. here. It's not like it's not trying to surprise you. <laughs> um, they're going up in three different increments. We're proposing this. So um, a little um, for the average average user, it'll be a little under four dollars starting um, in April first, twenty twenty two. It would be three eighty three additional a month, uh, depending on what service you get. This is again for. I think the 64 gallon garbage can. Um, and then again, there'd be another increase of 383 January 1st, 2023. And then again in January 1st, 2024. And this was proposed and went before the Utilities Rate Advisory Commission through a few workshops and then also in a public hearing, which uh, the public was notified of and provided public comment at. So that was on November 17th. Um, and the Utilities Rate Advisory Commission did recommend to go forward with the rate adjustment, but it'll go before City Council now on January 25th, and that will be the final decider. So what City Council will decide. Uh, just a, real quick, um, uh, you breeze through the numbers. I'm just curious, do, do you know the percent increases? It's a little under, I think it's around 10, a little under 10%. 10, um, wow. so, I mean, depending what you subscribe, but see your, if your monthly, um, payment is about forty two fifty nine, then the increase is three eighty three. So it's under ten percent. It's maybe under nine percent. Um, sorry, I don't have a percentage chart on here, but I can send that. We have lots of uh, our presentation to the Utilities Rate Advisory Commission, which is available online, where you go look at City Council meetings and agendas. You can view all our materials that we presented there, which puts this information in a lot of different formats, so you can look at it different ways. Um, we're trying to figure out the best way for customers to see it, so this might not be perfect, but we're hoping just to show kind of what that incremental rate adjustment will look like. 
for most customers. Uh, so your rate would go from 42.59 to 46.42 for the average customer. And then just, just so I'm reading this correctly, uh, between now and three years from now, it's, it's got a, looks like a $12 increase? Yeah, overall it would be about 11.50. Okay, all right, thanks, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm curious. So where I live, and I'm not sure about Oak Park, where I live, I pay city and county utilities. Okay. And I'm just curious, this is strictly city because I keep getting, you know, like increases in my city, my county. Uh, we just got notification of a, um, a, a an increase for, up, uh, you know, uh, updates for the sewer and stormwater whatever mm -hmm. that's another four bucks a month i'm just curious this is strictly city this is strictly does it have anything to do with the county as well we're working with the county and, and kind of consulting and a lot of municipalities are collab are consulting with each other to see what everyone's doing um but the county is a separate service but they are also implementing this around i think it might be around the same time i'm not sure um everyone's developed a lot of municipal so the state you know, mandated this law, but they didn't fund it and they didn't really provide any municipalities. You know, we all get to determine how to offer this to our customers, how to provide it, and we have to. Um, so we're kind of working to develop our program right now, and so is the county, and we're doing that alongside each other. Um, so they'll be moving from, uh, they right now collect their yard waste every other week, and so they'll be moving to weekly because nobody wants their food waste sitting around for, you know, week to week. Um, so there'll be changes coming along with the county as well. Okay. But yeah, there are, but yeah, the, the utilities are also, they're proposing a rate adjustment with the storm drainage. It is unfortunate timing that it's happening um, together, but. And pg e too, probably. <laughs> oh, really? Probably. Probably okay. Why Thank not? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, here's just some additional challenges we faced with, you know, with the stay at home order, it, um, it affected our overall bottom line and our, our reserve fund just because we had such, so much more demand during the time that people you know, they're disposing of all their waste at home. So rather than that going to commercial facilities, it's going to ours and it just has overall increased the service that we need to provide and, and our landfill fees um, and all that. So all of these, all of these different factors have combined to um, push us to ask for this rate adjustment. Um, and again, it'll go before city council, January 25th. I think, I'm not sure if we'll be in the, I think it'll be in the afternoon, the 5 p.m. meeting, but I'm not sure. But just out of, out, of, out of curiosity, do you know where these rate increases stand relative to other metropolitan areas like us? Are we are we way above, below, average? I think, I think we're around the middle. That's a good question. That's another um, chart that I, we have in our, our um, that's a good one we could include on here for if we have to, this is actually our last presentation, but if there are more. Um, but yeah, we're around the middle. We're definitely comparable to other cities of similar size. Um, I don't remember specific ones we picked out, but um, but yeah, that that material again is in the presentation, but but we're comparable. Um, here, I'll put it back on the rate chart again so you can see those. Um, and but otherwise, that is the end of my presentation, and we're happy to answer questions um, if you have any. And thank you for the questions you've already been asking. Uh, Becky. Uh, I, I have actually a question here. Um, Jess or anyone on a call, I, I am, you know, I'm, I, I can't pay attention to everything. So when stuff gets passed and uh, and all that, it's just, you know, you find out after the fact. Did did I did I understand you correctly that you said? Yes, Jess, um, you uh, called on me. Yeah. Um, did I understand you properly when you said that uh, this was passed? However, it was not funded, and so we're looking at ways to, to help fund this. And, and am I correct to say that these rate increases are towards funding of these measures? Um, yeah, so it's a statewide law that was passed in 2016 by Governor Brown. And so it's been coming into fruition by different steps. And so it's the entire state has to be compliant by 22, has to in, implement an organic cycling program for their residential customers, but the state didn't provide funding for it. That's right. So I believe there will be different grants and opportunities in the future that the state is maybe offering, but they're really not guaranteed whatsoever. So it's up to us to, you know, have developed these, uh, made these agreements with our organics recycling vendors and um, also pay for it. 
but our overall costs have also increased and just general landfill tipping fees have increased and our, our reserve fund has decreased. So either way, we would need to go forward for some kind of rate adjustment, but it definitely is the organics recycling is a huge factor. Thank you. Okay. If I, can I speak now? Becky, yeah, thank you. Uh, it sounds like uh, the organic waste is now going to be turned into compost which is much more valuable than what we've been getting from the city. Mm -hmm. So why are we not capitalizing on that more valuable uh, product and not raising the rates or raising them less anyway? That's a good question. Uh, we will still be selling it to you know, local agricultural users like winemakers and, um, and we do wanna have a giveaway eventually for our customers. So for all of us, we'd be able to go and maybe pick up um, you know, some compost on an afternoon or something and be able to have a big compost giveaway. We need to develop that program, but we do want to do something like that. But it still overall would not offset the cost of, of what it costs us to, to collect all this waste and then to bring it to those facilities and have those agreements, so. Yeah, I understand. It's a good question. It sounds, it, sounds like, it sounds like a very losing program then. Uh, I would say that if it's going to be an unfunded mandate, then we need to talk to our state senators and tell them, hey, you get this unfunded mandate here, let's fund it. The, city, the kids yeah. has got more money. Yeah, this would be a sack recycle or cal recycle. They're the state agency that reg that creates all the regulations and uh, enforces this law. So that would be- so they, can just, they can just make this, the Cal Recycle can just make this mandate, just pull it out of their back pocket? It's, well, it's with the aim, um, with sustainability and aiming to reduce climate emissions and short-lived climate pollutants. But, but yes, I mean, it'd be essentially like the plastic bag you know, a plastic bag ban or something where they have it in different cities that might not cost as much, but you know, the cities have to figure out how to implement it and how to educate their customers. So we have to do all the outreach and um, provide people that information and ways to participate um, in the program and you know, all of that. And Cal Recycle does have a lot of resources on their website. And I do suggest people take a look at the SB 1383 resources on Cal Recycle's website um, and, and they update them as well as the program develops. But but yeah, ultimately it's you know just a, a state mandate that we all have to, to follow. Well, I, 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 I'm a real proponent, but uh, if you've got something and you're gonna make something more valuable out of these two or three somethings, then you should be making a profit rather still, than yeah. Then it lo still losing money. It still always costs us more to dispose of our waste than we ever recoup, unfortunately. Um, it just isn't worth as much as it costs to collect it and dispose of it and what it, what it takes the landfills. Um, but maybe eventually, um, who knows, maybe the you know, Cal Recycle might make developments or provide funding or um, again, there, there are grants that are popping up that we're, we're getting noticed about, but it's you know still something you apply for and they're competitive and you never know what you might get and they go for Have you ever in your life ever seen services for garbage pickup or water ever go down? No. So we are never going to recoup the money that we're being charged now. No, and our, and our costs for disposing of waste in general, just across the board, and it's a global problem, honestly, the cost of, you know, disposing of our recycling, which is still a waste stream, that those fees go up and down and they are overall on a trend, you know, upward. So it's it's true that waste disposal is expensive. It costs us a lot and it, and it costs, you know, customers. I, I definitely, yeah, it, it is unfortunate. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so, so Becky, let's let's move on to the, a couple other folks have their hands raised. Joan and then Barbara. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's just I'd heard about this. I started looking at it um, a few months ago, and then of course now since the um, 
it's coming closer. There's more, there's more talk about it. So I see that the effective date is April 1st. Um, I worked for the state, so I understand RFPs, contracts, bids, all that stuff. Um, so if it was 2016, um, I don't understand why, you know, grants this and that, why if you guys, it's not anybody's fault, it's a curiosity. If it was coming down the pipe, have we been paying into this bit by bit already? That's what I thought we were doing as um, rate payers. I mean, obviously you needed some sort of infrastructure, you know, doing the RFPs and then the companies that um, received the bids, they just weren't sitting there. I mean, they saw an opportunity and started modifying for it. So, um, so anyways, I'm just curious. My basic question is through since 2016, have we as rate payers paid into any of the prep for this? Um, so I'll answer what I do know, which is that, <clears throat> and that's a great question, thank you. Um, I know that in 2019, and I'm new to the department and for working for the city, in fact, uh -huh. um, but I do know that in 2019, we went forward for a rate adjustment in anticipation of this program coming and also to you know, satisfy our other, our other needs and our other funding um, lack. But we were given a partial rate adjustment by city council and they recommended we go through, you know, different implement different efficiencies, which I've talked about in this presentation. A lot of them were prompted by um, our request for a rate adjustment, which was, again, only partially given. Um, and the other reason is that we didn't know what it would cost to have these organic to have the organic recycling program until we put forth that that RFP, I believe, mm -hmm. our request for proposals to um, oh, and then John might pop in and answer as well. Um, yeah, so I know that it was partially granted and that um, and that it helps now that we know what it'll cost us to implement this organics recycling program, um, which we didn't fully before. Um, and Don, did you want to add anything now? I, I've got a, I, I, you know, you're doing great, Jessa. Yeah, I've got a, a, some, pulled up some of the other charts because you're in the presentation. Some of the backup, including what other jurisdictions paid, that was one of the questions. Another one is the three vendors who take the organic waste. About 60% of our material goes to the Republic Services Transfer Station on Elder Creek Road in the South area and is managed by a company called Agromin, A-G-R-O-M-I-N. And they're a compost marketer. So our material goes south Stockton, uh, gets into a compost facility. It's, there's a tremendous amount of processing. There's lots of contamination uh, historically when you add food to the program because it's food, soil, paper, and people get excited and throw a lot of food, soil, paper in and some of it's gotta be picked out. Then the material has to be grinded. Then it has to be screened. Then it has to be windrowed in a compost, but it takes months and it's the permitting, unfortunately, for those facilities is extremely expensive. And the price for permitting goes way up when you add food waste, which is the liquid, addressable portion of garbage. So the compost revenue on the back end is built into our pricing. And so it doesn't, um, it, it is actually as, as expensive or more expensive than garbage. And it's much more expensive than what we used to do with our green waste only, because once the food waste is in there, it's got to go to a different facility. So uh, and then a question about contributing in. As Jessa mentioned, we went in 2019 for a partial rate adjustment, at about four, four to five dollars, and we're going back for 11.49. So if you add all that together, you know, 11.49 over three years, it's about. $16 over a five to six year period. So, you know, a couple bucks a year. The County of Sacramento, solid waste and not the other bills that the, the, the person who's, you know, got half county, half city, I'm not sure how that, uh, you only get recycling solid waste from one or the other. But you don't get that from both. They're going up about $18 total at five and five. Uh, $5 about a year and a half ago, $5 just now in January, and then $2 over four years. So their is going up 18, ours is going up about 16. Uh, across the state, 
the increases for this program are in the 10 to $20 a ton range. It's straight across. It's very, we've done a lot of research on that. So then the other two vendors, um, the smaller portions, because most of the city south of the river and goes to that one facility I mentioned on Elder Creek, are YOLO, and that's the west side of town, is going right to a compost facility at the YOLO Central Landfill, north of Davis and south of Woodland. And the other that uh, Jessa mentioned goes to our North Area Recovery Station. It's actually long hauled from there up to uh, near Wheatland. There's a compost facility, Feather River Organics, where it where they have a permit and they compost the material. So all the long hauling, all the, um, the new permitting for the food waste in it is what drives the cost way beyond anything you can recover with compost. So those are the three. I wanted to share it if, if you wanna see where we compare for solid waste and recycling services. I also have a, a chart with percentages ready to go and I can share a screen uh, at some point, you know, uh, if we if you want to see that. So I wanted to catch up on some of the questions that have been uh, coming. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, uh, Barbara? Yeah, I'm just curious, this rate increase, is that, the same increase for everyone, no matter how big your property is, how big your house is. I mean, the thing that I kind of struggle with, just like recently, this increase that I'm getting for my, I mean, I think everyone's getting for repairs to sewer and water filtration and everything else. It's based on, um, you know, like if you have a quarter of an acre or less or whatever. And some of my utilities are based on a number of rooms. So my house is pretty small. I have very little waste. I have the smallest garbage can you can have. I have the smallest recycling can you have. Um, green waste is the same for everyone. It doesn't matter. And yet the fees are the same. I can tell you I'm not alone. I don't have a lot of the same kind of waste that other people have, but I'm assuming that no matter what everybody is getting paid is charging the same. And I can tell you, I haven't looked lately, my combined city and county utilities on a monthly basis are about $160 a month for my little house. And things, I understand things go up. I'm all in favor of recycling and organic and all of that, but it just doesn't seem equitable that somebody who lives in a 3000 square foot house has a whole bunch of people living there. I mean, I don't know how you monitor that, but I have very little waste. And all I know is my utilities just keep going up. We, we have a variable can rate for garbage. So the 38 yes. is the lowest. Yes, so that's the, lowest the only thing the I get a break on. Yeah, that's right. That's well, that's the uh, across the, the, the state. There is really no pay as you go or sort of a weight or you'd have to have maybe a scale on your, um, you know, on the side loader that picks up the can. Um, it, the variable can rate is the, is the mechanism for which solid waste is, is adjusts for the, you know, 5,000 square foot home that might have 90 gallon cans. So they pay not just above you on the 64 gallon, but the 95, and then they pay for the second can. So um, that's, so that's, that's the variable can rate and that's all, that's what we offer. And that's, it, it, you know, water for a long time was unlimited. Now it's on a meter. It's a, it, over time, there may be some changes in that. But that is an industry standard. We're not city uh, any any different. The other question I didn't get to was the request for proposals. The uh, woman who worked for the state. Um, we did a combined request for proposals for those three contracts we mentioned with the city of Folsom and Sacramento County. We combined our tonnage. Volume uh, generates economies of scale and stimulates private investment. So we had private contractors bid on RFPs. We got eight proposals and we implemented three of those contracts. So the uh, so it was competitive. In other words, it wasn't some just deal we did like negotiating. We did a public procurement uh, and implemented contracts with that that give us five to ten years. Of, of service for all this materials. And they're in the eight figure range, just $20 million contracts and $50 million is the big one. So, uh, but it was competitively bid. So it's the best price we can get for the market in terms of what it costs to process all this material. So 
I have a question. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm curious. So I think it might have been maybe your third slide, but like, uh, yeah, that third, yeah, number three, just one, one up from that. Um, so this is the list of like what can we, what we're going to be able to newly put into our green waste bins, right? So we so already put, yeah. we already put landscape stuff in there, but then this would be food stuff too, and and what kind of food stuff? Um, yeah, it'll include food, food scraps and like, this is a really limited, this is just bare bones examples. Um, so there'll be, you know, your eggshells, banana peels, but also things that you wouldn't put in your backyard compost, which would be, you know, um, like meat and bones, uh, things like that. Also, uh, compostable plastic bags. You can use that in the industrial compost, whereas you wouldn't in your backyard, um, certain food sale paper, like, uh, any of that non-waxed paper um, and not coated in plastic. Like John said, we will get a lot of the paper that, you know, people will be really enthusiastic um, and hopefully, you know, put it in their hoping or wish cycle. But um, we're gonna get a lot of stuff that we can't, we can't process in that because people put plastic on everything. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, we will be accepting a lot of items that are not accepted in, the, in, your, in your backyard compost. And you can always check the waste wizard. Um, if you go to sortsmart.org or to sacrecycle.org, there's a little app that you can use to see where something goes. And so you'll be able to put in those things, um, especially you know, as we get closer to this and people wanna know about specific items. Um, so that'll always be on the website too. Okay. And then the, the bin that folks, the, the, the next slide down is, so you guys are giving away these free bins so that people can have something in their house to at least put the compost in, put the scraps yeah. in, and then yeah. take that out and dump it in their green waste. Yeah, you can put it in a bowl too, like not a wooden bowl because it's too porous, but a ceramic or metal bowl or something, or you know, or just a container, put it in your freezer. Um, nice. I've been trying various ways because I, I John has a little sample there because um, I started trying backyard composting and seeing what works best for me to avoid, you know, pests and things. and. Um, we'll have tips in the little handout we give and on our website, but, you know, you could layer, like if you don't want to use bags, you could use a paper bag, you can use newspaper, um, old paper towels, like you can layer food soil paper with that food waste and that'll help reduce pest attractions. When you put it in the outside container, uh, you wouldn't want to layer the yard waste trimmings at the bottom and kind of try to couch the food waste in that green waste. Um, all those things will help reduce um, the possibility of there being odor or or pests, but um, but yeah, we're providing a lot of that education to customers. We know it's you know it's a big new habit that we're all going to have to start, and it's not intuitive necessarily. And um, so we want to make sure that we give people the tools to, to succeed okay. in this program. And, and I know Matthew Ampersand has a question as well. But before going to him, um, where I grew up in, in in a rural part of Mendocino County, we were we didn't throw meat like like we. You know, we just throw eggshells, veggies out kind of in the woods and, you know, to just kind of do its thing. But we didn't throw meat or anything gnarly out there because there were like raccoons and animals. And so I was kind of a little surprised that this, the meat was like part of this um, because wouldn't it attract raccoons and animals? Not any more than the other. Um, yeah, not in the, the industrial composting. Um, yeah, as far as I know. But, but yeah, just the processing is so much more rigorous that it can uh, break down those other materials that you wouldn't want to put in your backyard. Okay. Thanks. And, hey, I don't know, Matthew, or if you're able to unmute yourself, I know you were asking some really good, making some good points and asking some good questions in the uh, chat here. Um, uh, so I'd love to hand it over to you. Hi, Adrian. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Ampersand. I am part of Find Out Farms located in South Oak Park. We are one of your multiple community compost hubs here in uh, Elk Park and around the region. We are working through a grant through Cal Recycle to be a community compost site where you can drop off your food scraps. Um, please, no meat or cheese. Um, and as was mentioned, you know, industrial composting or municipal composting does get traveled very far away. It has a large carbon footprint because of it, though it can take things like uh, quote unquote biodegradable plastics uh, or uh, paper pressed that's been used like for egg cartons or for to-go containers that have PFAS 
which is a, a chemical compound that doesn't break down. So it stays in the compost. Uh, whereas a small community compost hub like Find Out Farms or the Eggery, uh, we are careful about what we put in our compost. So we create healthy soil that then stays here in Oak Park. We use that soil here to grow vegetables and fruit and it goes back right into our neighborhood as a low carbon footprint. Uh, we actually keep track of how much methane we're diverting, and it's a it's a very sustainable way of doing uh, this at a, at scale. It's a totally possible to do a small community compost throughout the region at scale, and divert a lot of our food waste. Um, if you are interested and you live somewhere outside of Oak Park, but for some reason you're in this program or this meeting, you can always check out findoutfarms.com backslash compost. We have a map there where you can check out your local community compost drop off sites. And um, yeah, I guess my question was just. Um, how, how does municipal compost deal with PFAS or like microplastics after grading? You know, it goes through a, a trommel and then gets through a shredder and then those little tiny pieces of uh, contamination, they, they, they stay in the compost, right? Uh, I don't know if John has comment on the process. Sure, um, I, uh, you know, PFAS is uh, polyfluoroalkyl substances. They're basically, um, there, uh, you know, every in everywhere. In fact, we had to test that at our landfill, um, and we found it present in the land in the old city landfill on 28th Street. We also found it in the background wells, which are unimpacted by the landfill. So we have these wells that we test to measure our landfill, which are the same as, um, or, or or which are clean. So, and they ended up with the same amount of PFAS, which means. It's in anything, you know, it's Teflon basically, right? You've probably seen the, uh, watch that awful uh, documentary about it too. It was really sad, but it's in our wash. It's in ski wax. We'll ski down the mountain and, and, and get it into our water. So it's present, the extent it's present in compost, you, or in anything that ends up in our can and looks like perhaps it's on a piece of wood or a, I don't know, it, it's pervasive and it's a forever chemical, wherever it is. It's in 80 or 90 percent of the people. I guess we all have a small percentage of it that prevalent. So um, to the extent it's in compost really can't be controlled. But all the uh, fines that are um, the plastics that uh, e even very, very fine plastics that don't break down, the non-compostable are uh, screened in the process. The screeners are so small, compost that eventually comes out and is marketed is it's black gold. It's it's got no contaminants in it, and it's it's, it's ag quality compost. We some of our uh, organics go to Scott in a, in a facility in Stockton, so it actually ends up in bag compost. So uh, they get it out. Uh, they screen it. Uh, we initially screen a lot of it before they trommel and grind it, so that they can get the bigger stuff and it doesn't get ground up. And that's on like a transfer belt and a, and a process. So they get it out, but any PFAS that is in there is at the micro levels, like it's in everything. It's, it's such a unfortunately pervasive and, and so built into our society. And they really, even the, the replacements for it now, they say are just as, almost as bad. So the devil we know, they call it. So anyway. <clears throat> Yeah, I appreciate that context. Um, so, and this is kind of a, a question then for Matthew. So Matthew, what do you do with the compost? So, you know, you're a small local composter, you're accepting, you got a grant to accept um, compost uh, from folks in the neighborhood. What do you do after that? You And where does it go? Uh, thanks for asking. So currently uh, we are a little half acre farm in South Oak Park and we grow a lot of vegetables and some fruit. And that compost gets put back into our system here at Find Out Farms. Eventually, the hope is that we have a large enough amount of compost that we just are overwhelmed with fresh, healthy soil and we can just give it away. Uh, that it all stays in Oak Park, uh, regardless of if it's staying here at Find Out Farms or going to go to another local community garden. Gotcha. That's great. Um, so remember, raise your hands if you have questions, because I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna keep asking questions. Um, so for Jessa and John, uh, I don't really know how they're. I'm a renter, so I don't know a ton about how the rate structures work here. But 
is there a way to like if a community member really wanted to like make all their green waste food waste go to matthew could they opt out and i know you probably don't want this but could they opt out of the city's pickups especially considering the increased rates and then just like divert entirely to matthew uh well so right now under the current program anyone who has a green waste container uh will just not it, it doesn't skip a beat you just stop taking food out of your uh garbage can and put it into your green waste can there are exempt customers right now there are about twelve thousand of our 138 so less than 10 percent those customers uh are going to get a smaller 38 gallon waste can they're no longer going to be exempt and they're in hoas that have landscaping or they're in new development with really low amount of pre you know density Eventually, after we roll that out, we are going to come out with an exemption program that would uh, allow someone to apply for an exemption. But due to the um, strict elements of the mandate, um, it will be pretty rigorous. You will have to prove you manage everything either on site, you will have to, uh, and I'm not sure about some of the material um that i think it was matthew's got a, a a compost community thing if if they take some of the organics that we will take in our program for example you know pizza boxes i mean certain things that can be composted and we're gonna have a very very large list of food soil paper because the regulations specify food soil paper as organic and therefore you are required to divert them so I, I don't know how extensive that program is. I know uh, what we take in our program is much more extensive than a backyard composting operation and lots of things you can't put in your backyard. So backyard composting in and of itself isn't gonna be enough for an exemption. Um, there's the, we have to unfortunately keep very, be fairly strict on exemptions or else everyone will want one. I mean, everybody's going to, you know, not, I don't eat bananas or I don't eat pizza. Or I don't, you know, we've heard a lot of people uh, wanting exemptions that, um, you know, uh, for reasons that are good. It's just in totality, what we have to do to meet the state mandate requires us to collect all organics. You can't put, you know, again, chicken bones, and we talked about that. They get, uh, in our tub grinder when when they get processed they get by the time they're done you wouldn't even notice it it's blended in with the green waste the moisture of it is actually it's absorbed with it actually food waste actually marries well in the container with the uh leaf and yard waste so uh but uh, we will have an exemption program but it's we have our basically our hands full between now and july to do the implementation and we're going to follow up with an exemption program after that but it's going to be something that requires staff to possibly make a site visit and there's going to be a lot of time and evaluation and there'll be a form you have to upload and the evaluation of it takes staff time so we're going to put a fee on it it's not going to be you know you can get, just get an exemption it doesn't cost you you have to pay to apply for the exemption and uh we may have site visits it, it, we're still developing the program and we're still trying to get feedback on the state as to what's permissible initially they said no exemptions but now they're saying you can offer residential exemptions in very limited circumstances, de minimis waivers, you know, not space constraints, but uh, you have to have a rigorous like program to uh, for people to apply through. So it's not gonna be easy, but we'll, we'll have one eventually. Gotcha. Any other questions for Jess or John? Stop sharing. Well, thank you guys so much for presenting to us and educating us a little bit more about the changes. Um, it's pretty major, uh, exciting, uh, and also kind of prompting us to think creatively about, you know, some other things we can do here in the neighborhood, to, you know, to be just more sustainable. <laughs> so. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Matthew, so for folks that are want to like learn more about your operation and and uh, all of that, all the great work you're doing, how can folks, uh, do you have any like ability, 
can people drop by the farm at any times? Can people provide, you know, give you their compost at any specific times or how can folks learn more about that? Thank you for asking Adrian. Yeah, every Friday from two to seven o'clock, we have compost drop off and farm drop in hours. We also have our community fruit program where we go out and harvest fruit and divert that from the waste stream as well. And share that directly with the community like Wellspring Women's Center in Elk Park. Uh, but yeah, every Friday, two to seven o'clock at 4712 Parker Avenue. It's 4712 Parker Avenue. And yeah, you're always welcome to come with your food scraps. Please do. Cool. Wonderful. And there are some, some other great farms and groups uh, in the neighborhood doing, doing similar work uh, as well. So wonderful. Okay. Um, well, so this is the, the part of our, of our agenda when we usually go into neighborhood updates. Um, and so, you know, we kind of do this roundtable style. There's really been a lot of stuff going on in Oak Park in the last month. Um, I don't know if, if someone wants to start with anything specific. Um, I, I could kind of list off a few things that we could talk about, but uh, if there are any specific announcements, now would, now would be the time or, or updates to share. I'm sorry, uh, Adrian. What are these updates you're asking for? Just neighborhood I was, updates. I was distracted. <laughs> neighborhood updates. So can it be sort of a city update? Yeah. That affects everyone? Sure. Sure. So I don't know how many people are aware. I, I did post something on the Neighborhood Association Facebook page about the um, proposed renovation of the state capitol. It's going to cost more than a billion dollars. I don't know how much money has been spent so far. I have asked assembly member McCarty about that some time ago, just to know because they've hired all kinds of consultants and attorneys and all kinds of other things that have happened around this. And personally, I find it very disturbing. The legislators have all moved out into temporary offices. I assume this is eminent. I don't know that we can stop this bus, this train, it's left the station. But considering that we have tens of thousands of people living on the street, no affordable housing, that they're spending over a billion dollars to provide new offices for our state legislators and more parking underground is incomprehensible to me. And just the most gross thing, I, I can't even, I have no words. So I'm just going to encourage everyone to call your assembly member and state senator, which would be Kevin McCarty and Senator Pan. Senator Pan is termed out, so I don't know how much this matters. And um, anyone else who is running for city council, not city council, but um, congressional or Senate seats, I mean, legislative seats, this should not be happening. A billion dollars. And this all started during the, day, the uh, Jerry Brown's administration. It's not Gavin Newsom, but everybody is moving it forward. And I just, it's obscene. So I just wanted to share that with people if you're not aware. Um, it's very troubling to me. So that's all I have to say about that. Thanks. Well, thanks, Barbara. And I, I pasted in the chat the, the group that I believe is the Save Our Capital group that, that I think is all sharing resources about you know, the removal of trees and some of the other concerns about the that annex project. So thanks for elevating that. Um, I might actually put Mr. Michael Blair on the spot. I don't know if he has, uh, I don't know how, how, how much he has to share, but Michael, do you, have you heard any updates about um, the COVID-19 COVID booster shot kind of coordination here in Oak Park? I know Back when, when the vaccines were initially available, we had folks at City Church and St. Paul and other folks who were able to provide, like open up their facilities and provide vaccines. And kind of wondering if there's something similar that's gonna happen with the new booster shot considering the new variant and everything going on. Yeah, thanks Adrian. I uh, do have a little bit of information. Uh, UC Davis, they got some money from uh, FEMA through the Department of uh, California Department of Public Health and put together a program where they're going to have some mobile units that are going to be running around uh, in talks right now with Oak Park Community Center and uh, Fruitbridge Community Collaborative, and I think one other location uh, to have some uh, more pop-ups, but certain days of the week 
uh, be located there. And then also uh, City Church is back on that uh, list as well. So there's going to be multiple locations. They're working out the schedule right now. So I'd imagine in the next week or so, probably should be some, see some more communication coming out about that. Uh, but one thing is uh, the first event that's kind of associated with this is going to be December 4th, which is uh, Saturday. And that will be at Salvation Army on Alhambra and Broadway. And the flyer just got produced today because there's a redo on it. But uh, Salvation Army is having a winter wonderland there. And uh, kind of the last minute since the UCD project was getting rolling, they just said, hey, let's, you know, combine these two events uh, and that'll give UC kind of their first spotlight in, uh, you know, rolling out and doing vaccines. So really anybody five and up can participate in this one. And I want to say it's from 10 to 1, but before we get off, I'll flash the flyer across the screen. I'll pull it up real quick. Everybody can see it. Um, and then also uh, California Department of Public Health, they're sponsoring a food truck. So it should be pretty festive. Uh, there's going to be Santa Claus there. I hear it's actually the real Santa Claus. So uh, kids should be excited. <laughs> <laughs> and Salvation Army, they really want to put some spotlight on what's going on there. It's that building that you drive by all the time that you, you know it's there. You look over, but you don't know what's going on inside. Uh, they're actually doing some really cool stuff. So they're trying to spotlight uh, everything that's going on inside the building and all that it can benefit for the community. And and they had free child care. They were looking for uh, folks to fill child care slots a few a couple yeah. of months ago, weren't they? Do you know if they were able to fill all of those slots? No, I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't do a follow up to find out, but I know they definitely had some slots available, and even the slots that weren't free. Well, I think it was free until January, I, I believe. And then even after that, the slots were only like 10 bucks a week, something, you know, relatively cheap. Um, so they're still working on that. And also they were looking for, um, for teachers as well. So they have free daycare and jobs. Yeah, and if, if you're able to share, uh, I see Barbara put it in the chat. If you're able to share that flyer about this Saturday, that'd be awesome. Sure will. Let's share the heck out of that. So folks, and, and you said, Booster shots will be available. Yep, yep. Uh, boosters and anyone five and up. So pretty much bring the whole family. Cool. Awesome. Um, one of the other things we could talk about was just the, and we alluded to this earlier, but, you know, the, the fatal car accident that happened on MLK and Broadway um, the other day. And then almost exactly two weeks before that, again, there were two people who, passed away at the stoplight at 42nd and Broadway. So both these accidents happen very close to each other in time and very close to each other in location. Uh, and I know, um, you know, like Dimitri here on the call is, his, you know, he, he runs the spot across the street, the Cap City co-working space across the street, right? Um, and, and so, you know, that's a really, really major intersection here in the neighborhood. And I know there's some folks, I, I believe Council Member Chenier is, you know, going to wrangle some folks together to try to talk about some solutions, some things that we can potentially do to improve that intersection to make, to, to prevent this from happening in the future. Uh, I know that building, that Arbor, the Arbor's building, which is senior affordable housing right there on the corner of MLK and Broadway, that I saw a headline that that building has been hit by nine different cars in, since 2014, nine different cars, which is just crazy to think about. So um, I know that uh, I, I just wanted to share a little bit of info uh, that was sent by Leslie Mancibo with the city of Sacramento. Uh, and Leslie was basically just saying, hey, I know that, you know, there are these, these awful accidents happening. People are, people are dying as a result of this. Um, but she wanted to share just some info about some of the upcoming plans that the city has for Broadway. Um, and it's really, there's really two kind of projects that I wanted to share with you guys. And I'm going to pull up, pull up her email, uh, to us just so that you can see this. Um, so, uh, there, there's kind of two, and hopefully, hopefully you guys can see this and hear me, but there's really two main, um, projects that are kind of in play here.
Did we just lose Adrian or everyone? I think we lost him. We lost Adrian. I see his name. Adrian, you there? Yeah, he's still listed as a participant, so I'm not sure what happened. And he's sharing his screen, so let me see if I can. Oh. All right, so we'll give him a second to come back on. I'm sure it's just some kind of technical issue. Any other announcements to share before he comes back? Anything else cool going on in the neighborhood? Oh, uh, as a matter of fact, there is um, City Refuge. Um, there's a lot happening on Saturday. Uh, they're having an event right around the 10 to 1 time frame as well. I can't remember what they're calling it, but I'll pull up that flyer as well, just so that we all have it. Um, and they're going to have uh, the other Santa Claus. So I guess there's more than one Santa Claus, but don't tell anybody. Uh, but anyway, they'll be, uh, they'll be there doing their thing. Um, so kind of dual events happening. Neighborhood will be busy that day. And while he's getting on, let me just see if I can. Oh, it's like he's coming back. Okay, in the meantime, I'll try to pull this up real quick. So give me a moment. Sorry about that. My computer totally like froze. <laughs> How much of that did you hear? <laughs> oh, you were gone, Adrian? Huh. <laughs> Yes. You know, yes. pretty much right when you started, it cut out. So we oh, didn't crap. catch any okay. of it. Yeah, All take right. it from the top. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so I started sharing my screen, right? Okay, hopefully uh, this works. Well, you, you started to share your screen, but nothing popped up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so check this out. So the, these are the, the projects, the, the, the projects that we need to know about along Broadway. So when we talk about the issues, the fatal crashes, uh, that are happening on Broadway. We, we this this is what is kind of in process already. That that I think will probably address a lot of these issues down the line. Um, in the long term, I think we still need to talk about short term solutions, though. So, fully funded, caught, they got all four point three million dollars to do this. Is the 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 extent the part of Broadway that goes from MLK to Stockton? So that's the east part of Broadway, right? Um, Eastern Oak Park, Eastern Northern Oak Park. Right. Uh, and then the, the part that's still that they're still trying to get funding for is the 99 to MLK spot slice. Uh, so so again, they're still, as you can see on this chart, they're still doing preliminary design. What what I know they have planned for the 99 to uh, or you can say 99 or Alhambra to MLK side is they're actually going to do one. They're going to remove one lane each way. They're going to put in bike lanes. They're going to repave the whole thing. Uh, and they're going to have some left turn. They're going to actually have to take out some palm trees. This was controversial, Barbara, because <laughs> they were taking out some trees. Um, but they're going to have to take out some palm trees along broad, along our beautiful stretch of Broadway to do left, to do kind of middle left turns so that you don't have to, so that traffic doesn't back up for folks trying to turn left uh, at some of those key intersections. Um, so again, they're looking for funding for that. Uh, but that will be a full redo of Broadway from 99 to MLK. They're already funded to do MLK to Stockton. That still doesn't mean, and again, construction's not till 2024. So we still we still have to figure out something in the short term, but at least in the long term, there's there is good stuff moving forward that will enhance safety on the corridor. Go ahead, Barbara. So the obvious question: what was the cause of these fatal accidents? So some others on this call might know more than me. Um, I don't know the cause of the the one on the seventeenth, the one at the light. Um, but I some I, I was chatting with uh, a, a Saint Hope employee today, actually, and I was able to see pictures of the of Saint Hope's office and um, you know the more recent accident and and kind of what happened there. And I believe and and that. That employee did believe that intoxication was a factor 
in, okay. in the more recent one. Uh, and so kind of the idea is, well, you know, we can do a whole bunch of safety stuff, but if people are driving while intoxicated, there's still a danger. And so what can we do kind of more, and again, that that's beyond transportation, right? That's like, what can we do <laughs> as a society to <laughs> ensure that that folks don't feel the need to self-medicate like that? So uh, it's it, again, that's just, that's not, you know, I don't think that's been confirmed, but I, that, you know, that person what did crash and did pass away, um, so. Because if it's if it's operator error, I mean we can't control that. So I'm not saying that things don't need to be modified, but um, I went through a whole lot of things about 21st Avenue. I don't live on 21st Avenue. People drive too fast. They run stop signs. They pass you when they're not on places where there's no passing lane. And I couldn't get anything done about any of that and was told all kinds of things. I mean, I went to the city, you, you know, transportation or whatever it is. So I'm just curious how all of this has come to be. If this is not a safety issue, it's a user error. Yeah. And, and I think Dimitri, you, you had a really interesting comment about uh, the way that that street is sloped. Dimitri, would you mind uh, kind of expanding upon that? Uh, Cause I, I thought it was really interesting. It was a good point about just kind of a fundamental issue with that, with MLK and Broadway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, right on that curve. And, and, you know, I've taken it many, many a times in my day, uh, not intoxicated or anything like that, but it, it banks when you're moving eastbound on Broadway and you're, you're curling right at the intersection of MLK, but you're, you're curling to the left on Broadway, it banks the road banks to the right. And anytime you're going through a turn like that, that does, if you, if you haven't driven it before, it does kind of sprout up on you a little bit. You should always have the road angled inwards towards the center. Uh, so you know, one of my recommendations was, is there any way that we can just increase the angle so that it's you know angled um, towards the interior, towards the inside of the lane? And hopefully Adrian, that answered your point. Yeah. Hundred percent, and I see I see others popping into the chat saying, "Yeah, like it's a bad, it's a bad angle." <laughs> yeah, so maybe that is something that I, again I you know don't know what city engineers might say, but like maybe there's something that could be done in the shorter term that before 2024 <laughs> that could that could help with this, right? Because I know I've taken that turn too fast a lot, and again, no, I'm not speeding or anything. It's just it's a bad turn. <laughs> So I, I believe there are there are you know there's community members who are who are and Jay Councilmember Chenier are, are trying to trying to come up with something some idea and I, I think there will be an opportunity for community input I know we got some good input from neighbors on the OPNA Facebook page today uh, just about some ideas um, a lot of it was hey we need a road diet as as long as the streets are are wide people are going to feel comfortable going fast um, so. Yeah. And of course they are going to, you know, develop that, that uh, piece of land just east of the, the arbors, you know, they're going to really extend the arbors really. Uh, it's going to be a di more, more senior affordable housing. Um, and so that'll, I think, again, elevate the need for that, that part of part of Broadway to get a redo. Adrian on the, um, uh, just on the regular, uh, the reports that you were given, is that repaving? I get the, the road diet, but are there any just strictly repaving of any roads in the Oak Park area between now and 2024? I think, I think all of, I, my understanding is, and don't quote me, is that it will be entire, an entire repaving, at least for the Envision Broadway, at least for the Western part uh, from 99 to, uh, to MLK. I don't about, know exactly. Go how ahead. about the road that, uh, that you get off on 34th and it runs adjacent to, um, uh, to Sac High. And that thing is just loaded. I, I got to drive that almost every day and it's just loaded with bottles. I hate yeah. it, but are, are they making the repaving into the neighborhood too, or is it just the business corridors? I think it's just Broadway. I don't know about uh, 30, 34th needs it too, though. Uh, yeah, good point. Yeah, and I mean, there's, you know, you go there at a certain time of day and there's a million cars there, kids, you know, uh, kids getting picked up from Sac High. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, Adrian, um, if it's okay, I'm gonna share those two, uh, two flyers I was mentioning. All yes. good? Oh, hold on. Okay, everybody should be able to see that. So this first one is City Refuge, Christmas in the City. So that's Saturday, one to four. Um, everybody knows where MLK, uh, where they are in MLK. And uh, face painting and pony rides. So they're like up in the game. So we got ponies in Oak Park now. Um, Santa and wow. Mr. Claus. So they got the whole family coming through. So that should be cool for, uh, for kids and uh, I guess adults too. And this other one is uh, the one about the vaccination. I mentioned it um, at the Salvation Army. So music, food, Santa, everything else. So that one is from 10 to noon. So they actually really don't, well, let's see, 10 to no, noon and then one to four. So yeah, they actually don't conflict. So it'd be like the after party, party then after party. So anyway, any questions on that? Um, feel free to call the info line there or just drop by. Awesome. Well, I'll maybe share my screen real quick and just go through some, some updates. Uh, so this is our Oak Park neighborhood newsletter. It's an email newsletter that we send out every month. This is what we're doing now. We're talking leafs. We actually didn't talk that much about leaf season, <laughs> but we talked a lot about organics recycling. Um, we, this, we're pretty proud of this and, uh, you know, Michael, you can speak to this as well, but, you know, OPNA has a program called uh, Oak Park Cares um, that we've launched um, a few months ago now, uh, where we're doing direct payments to residents uh, who need help paying their bills. It's called Oak Park Cares, and we're doing it in really mainly $200 chunks, but folks can request less than that. Most folks request the maximum. Uh, and we've been able to pay out over $8,000 uh, in the last 100 days through this program, just sending folks checks. Um, some of them request a Zelle payment, you know, um, and, and in some, we've been mostly mailing them. In some cases, we've been dropping them off uh, and just meeting, meeting our neighbors in need. So uh, if you'd like to donate, uh, you can go to oakparkna.com. Uh, we really appreciate all the donations. We, we just got a, an awesome donation from PG&E. They gave us $3,000 to give out to residents. Uh, and then uh, our former former uh, Sac City Unified School District trustee, Jesse Ryan, is also giving us several hundred dollars to, for, for, for residents as well. So um, really, really appreciate the support. And, um, you know, and if you feel so, so inclined, feel free to donate. Um, so again, we talked a bit about the fatal accidents. This image is from the... So uh, the website, Barbara, was oakparkna.com. I know it's kind of weird that we're a .com. We're, we're, we're a nonprofit. Uh, I don't know where the .com came from. That was before, <laughs> before my time. Um, but so this is an image of the 42nd and Broadway crash, the fatal crash, uh, where two people passed away. Um, and, and so again, there, there, are, there are efforts to improve Broadway along that stretch, but uh, I know there's, there are gonna be community members and others meeting to talk about short-term solutions. And if you do have you know, ideas about short-term, maybe low cost things that could be done, you know, I'm all ears. I, I was thinking maybe just a four-way stop at MLK and Broadway, you know, just stop signs. <laughs> like would, I, I know it might, it might cause a bit of a backup, but it'd be a heck of a lot safer, I feel like. Um, we're also partnering with the Latino Center of Art and Culture on a, the La Pastorella uh, play. This is happening at the Guild Theater. The dates on the flyer are not correct, uh, unfortunately, but, the, but you can go to the Eventbrite page and I'll post the link when I'm done sharing um, to, to the correct dates. Uh, but it's this wonderful play that they put on here at, at Oak Park's Guild Theater um, uh, every, every holiday season, every kind of Christmas time. And, and it's they're super political. It's kind of like a hero's journey story, but it's super political. They actually, at our, at our November OPNA meeting, you know, you, if you attended, you might remember Richard Falcone uh, actually asked us to help him design the characters. So the characters are based on Oak Park folks. Um, and so it'll be really interesting to go check out. And there is a free day for Oak Park residents. Um, we'll be sharing more info about that soon. Uh, McGeorge Law School here in the neighborhood proposed uh, to rezone its entire campus. So 
we kind of don't know exactly what this is going to look like because there isn't like a, a plan really beyond just they want a different zoning commercial i believe it's commercial zoning i'm not an expert in this uh, michael might know more he's he's more in the land use space um but they they it, with the, if this rezone happens it basically means they could build more stuff on their campus so potentially more housing or maybe bigger buildings i don't know if you have anything to add on that michael i don't know much about zoning you know i don't uh, i haven't kept up with this one uh to the level that i will but yeah at the moment i don't have any any additional okay adrian is it, is it just for their students or are they are they um do you know if it's just for the students or for something bigger than that or broader don't know all right I do know they uh, quite a while ago were planning to bring different schools onto the campus. I think like school of dentistry and and some other stuff. So they're, um, you know, the plan is not to just stick with law and kind of expand out from that. So that could have you know something to do with it. Dentistry. Yeah, I think dentistry and something else too. I can't remember. It was quite a while ago. It was maybe two years ago they started the planning, and I haven't uh, been back in the loop since. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, well, yeah, they're going to need more housing <laughs> if they're going to be doing all these programs. Um, so this next one, this is really important. So uh, Highway, there are, there, Caltrans has secured $15 million for a whole bunch of projects along Highway 99 from 50 to like Calvine, or Mac Calvine area. Uh, this is the map of all the projects. It's, it's twisted like 90 degrees. So you can see that 99, you know, we're, we're in the bottom left in Oak Park and, it go, and then it goes up to the top right and that's south. So it's flipped like 90 degrees, um, but it's on, you know, it's uh, as we used to say in school, this is a hot dog style piece of paper instead of hamburger style, I think. So, or no, this is hamburger style, I forget. Anyway, um, so, so you can see all these projects happening, happening along 99 and they include the the underpass uh, under of Broadway under Highway 99, the Second Avenue underpass, the um, Fifth Avenue overpass, right next to McGeorge, the Twelfth Avenue 99 intersection, the Twenty First Avenue underpass, uh, and more, and then Fruit Ridge and 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 uh, 99. So, and a couple other things. So. Caltrans kind of wants to work with us on some of these designs. And this is pretty cool, actually. Um, so that slope paving that's going to happen at all those underpasses, if you look at the top right of this, that's kind of like the before and after um, on the top right and then the one under it. And so what they do is they put in new concrete and they make a little a design and it looks a lot nicer than just kind of the basic concrete and dirt thing. Uh, and so they they wanted our feedback, the neighborhood's feedback on these designs that kind of look like the Sacramento River. Uh, and so I know we've kind of put together a bit of a stakeholder group and had a couple of meetings with Caltrans to try to hash this out. But if you're interested in being in that stakeholder group uh, and providing your feedback, just drop your email address in the chat, um, please. And we'll collect that and make sure that you are in those meetings if you want to be. Uh, I'm gonna, just going to go to the next slide. So they also are going to be doing colored uh, fencing. So like when you think about the Fifth Avenue overpass, like by McGeorge, um, or the pedestrian bridge on like 7th and 8th Avenue, um, over 99, they actually are, are allowing us to pick what colors we want for the, the chain link fencing. Uh, so some, some of us were thinking like, oh, maybe, you know, we could have a, you know, a set of colors that feels like it's the Oak Park neighborhood colors. Uh, maybe it could be even the OPNA green. I don't know. Um, or, or uh, you know, maybe down further down, I know the, the Franklin corridor, you know, as 99 goes closer to Franklin, you know, they have a big Latino population. So maybe there are colors there that, that you know, they might like to see uh, on their overpasses and kind of uh, along their part of 99. And then further down on Mac, on Florin Road and Mac Road, maybe there's things, other colors that kind of speak to those neighborhoods as well. Um, so it's kind of been a cool, a cool, uh, a cool project for them to do. So again, they want our, they want our, our input on it and they say they'll do it. Uh, and then this is kind of the big kahuna is the art along 99. So they want to, on the left, these are sound walls. So sound walls, you know, are the big things that 
you know, make the noise of the highway not be as bad. Um, and they, they're, they kind of mocked up these designs. They want our feedback on them on the left side. So you see like a river, you see like hilly trees and you see like a, they call it foothill and water waves. So it's all kind of a little abstract, uh, but they want to do this all, all along 99, really kind of make it look better. And then on the right side, they want to do these steel panels. So this is like half inch steel, big panels that they would put in key locations. And if you go back to the map, you know, you can see in these boxes what is happening where. So we would be getting the, uh, you know, the steel panels, um, you know, it, it particularly Fruit Ridge, and it looks like Fruit Ridge and uh, 99, and then further down south. So um, anyway, they, they wanted like, and we were saying, oh, maybe we could find a local artist to help with the design. So again, if you're interested in being in these stakeholder meetings, drop your email in the chat. Um, and we can work on it. Um, yeah, so that, that's the main stuff for, for the Clean California for the, the 99 project. Um, oh, Michael, do you want to talk about this one? Sure. So um, construction, uh, there's a lot going on in the city and surrounding areas. And there's a program that uh, works with folks to take them through a uh, pre-apprentice program. So um, just, just to kind of define the, the terms, once you start in construction and you're in the unions, you're an apprentice on day one and you continue to be apprentice until you turn into a journey person. And that can take anywhere from usually three to five years or three to seven years, depending on, you know, what trade you're in. So uh, what we do is there's a program that takes folks through a pre-apprentice program. So this just teaches them the fundamentals of construction, uh, kind of gets them acclimated to um, all the ins and outs, uh, even on the, you know, the technical side and the leadership development side. And so try to create a you know, whole rounded person to go into the industry so they can be successful. And then uh, there's a partnership with the building trades that they know this pre-apprentice pre uh, program is going on. So those are the folks they, they pull from uh, and they give them priority into the construction industry. Uh, without going through this program, you can still get into construction. Um, you can go directly to the unions, uh, but you just don't get the priority. So uh, with this program, it's focused on about 25 students at a time. And it's a six week program. And the students that graduate, well, it's actually gonna start on the 27th of this month and then go until I wanna say February 18th, I think is the last day uh, for that cohort. And once they graduate, uh, Aggie Square would have broken ground already. So it's highly possible that some of those folks would be able to participate. Um, but the way it works is it really depends on their particular trade because for instance, if they do tile, let's say they go in and want to be a tile person. Well, when they're breaking ground, you know, they're digging in the ground, they're doing all the foundation stuff. So it's going to be quite a while before a tile person, you know, even comes into play. So, uh, but anyone working on cement and that kind of thing, you know, they might be first to actually touch the Aggie Square project and, and work on it. So anyway, it's a, there's an information session coming up on the 6th, Monday. And if anybody wants more information, just click on. We'll tell you more about it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. Cool. Uh, and then this is an announcement from the Attorney General's office. They uh, made several arrests uh, of members of the Oak Park Blood Street Gang. Uh, I guess it was earlier, it was last month, it was in November. Um, they served 19 search warrants and 15 arrest warrants. Uh, and they recovered 24 firearms, um, and they also found ghost guns and ghost gun manufacturing equipment. So just FYI, <laughs> I don't know much about these sorts of like, you know, target stings or whatever, but uh, yeah, this happened. <laughs> I, 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 my understanding, and, and others I'm sure know more than I, but uh, is that Oak Park Bloods, a lot of them are not in Oak Park, so this, this could be, you know, folks not necessarily in the neighborhood, but, but elsewhere, you know, South Sacramento or whatever. So I don't know if anyone has anything else to add on this.
Okay. And then uh, our friends over at Alchemist CDC are doing a wonderful bus stop. It's going to have a, or the friendliest bus stop in town is what they're calling it, um, with Nor NorCal construction training. Uh, and I think SMUD paid for it as well as a, another generous donor. So it's going to have a shade structure. It's going to have nice seating. It's going to have one of those little free libraries uh, and, a, and a pantry. Maybe that's for, for food. I'm not sure. A bike rack, a bike repair station, a solar powered Wi-Fi hotspot, and a phone charging station. So isn't that cool? That's super cool. <laughs> hey, Matthew, you have your, your hand raised. Do you know if there's plans to make that a bus stop again? Like, is there going to be bus service there? Uh, I don't, I, I am not aware of any plans to make that an actual bus stop. Good question. <laughs> Good question. Um, but you know, if we can keep, you know, if Tahoe Park was able to keep, you know, to, uh, to impact, you know, route bus routes, uh, when, when they were threatened with the removal of their bus service. Yeah. I, I feel like if we, you know, if enough folks in the in Oak Park cared, we could, we, we could potentially bring it back. Uh, and then Michael, uh, this is the last thing I have. Do you have anything you'd like to share on this one? Free technology. Sure. So partnership with um, uh, United Way and SMUD and Ran City of Rancho Cordova, City of Sacramento, uh, and then my um, nonprofit neighborhood innovation, uh, working together to get computers out to the community. And the whole goal is really breaking the digital divide, making sure that uh, folks have access to the internet. And even if you have a computer at home, I know a lot of times it's either you have no computer or you know folks are sharing one computer. Um, so this program, um, you can actually get a free refurbished computer. Um, the the requirements is that uh, are that you can't make over thirty thousand dollars. Um, so when you go on to apply, it'll ask you for proof of that. And um, a lot of folks are just taking a picture of their um, uh, Medi-Cal card or anything, anything of the such to show that you're on some kind of public assistance. And with that, you qualify instantly. Uh, they try to keep it a, a, a low bar. Um, so the application is maybe just like one page pretty quick. So you can go ahead and apply and then someone will contact you and let you know when you can pick it up and where. There's probably about a good seven partners around the city that are actually doing the distribution. Neighborhood Innovation is, is the one that's uh, in Oak Park, uh, kind of working the 17 and 20 area codes. So feel free to call that number to RFCP, get on the list. And when I say refurbished computers, it's pretty much whatever shows up to the warehouse, then they fix them and bring them back. But we've been doing this, um, it's like the second year now. And I've seen, I've seen, we got a batch one time of like the old dinosaurs, right? The big towers with the loud fans and that kind of thing. Um, you know, folks weren't really excited about those. However, if you can't get on the internet and you're sharing with somebody else, then, you know, that could really be a lifesaver. It, it, it can get, get the purpose or, or you know, get, get the job accomplished. Um, but since then, that was just one batch. Uh, the rest of them have actually been very nice. Um, they have some all-in-ones where you have the uh, computer that's built into the monitor. Um, and a lot of them, you know, they really don't have much wear on them. They've actually, you know, kind of come in in pretty good shape. I don't know where they come from, but there's an organization that just refurbishes them, lets us know, and then we go pick up and do the distributions. Um, so anyway, uh, you can look forward to something probably fairly pretty nice. They have like, uh, there was a batch that came through really nice ones with touch screens and uh, swivel monitors, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and then uh, some, you know, that's Dells, it's HPs, it's kind of all over the map. Uh, but anyway, feel free to check it out if you have a need or share with anyone that uh, that might have a need. And, uh, just needs to get that internet connection. Yeah, thank you for that. I see that uh, Matthew posted in the chat, Sack Shelter Pets Alive Holiday Cabaret. That's December, on December 11th. So maybe you can Google Sack Shelter Pets Alive Holiday Cabaret and find more info about it. <laughs> Any other announcements? Anything else going on?
All right. Well, uh, we'll capture the chat and uh, we'll be following up just uh, on some of the items we talked about today. Really appreciate everybody making the time and uh, have a good, have a good holiday. Get, get your booster shot and um, yeah, we'll see you at the next, next time. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right. Bye everybody.